Open up your Bibles to the book of beginnings, the book of beginnings. That would be Genesis, Genesis chapter 11, and we will be looking at verses 10 through 32 tonight, the promised line of redemption, the promised line of redemption. That's what we're looking at tonight. Its emphasis, this text is the line from one of Noah's sons, Shem, all the way to the father of the nation Israel, that is Abraham, formerly named Abram, as we will see tonight. Before reading this text, we will read it in two sections. First, the genealogy, and then specifically Abraham, his birth and his location of his birth. Before we go into that, I would like to introduce the text and then get our minds wrapped around it. It is, uh, as some other texts we have seen in the book of Genesis, a rather technical text. We have most of it consuming of names and a genealogy, uh, and the next half a genealogy well with a, as well with a few details. So uh, we are going to do our best to be as technically accurate, but also find some applications. I think there are some very good spiritual applications that we can make from this text. So as you're there in Genesis chapter 11, verses 10 through 32, I will introduce it. You know, no details are recorded in the Bible or in history from the 200 years from the scattering at Babel till the birth of Abraham. We really don't know much that is going on at that time. Actually, our text is the only uh, history that we have of 200 years of world history. Surely there are some important, amazing things that happened during this time, but God did not choose to record any of those. We only have this genealogy and specifically one family, Terah's family, where they were located, uh, who they worshipped, and where they went. Because of, we do know some things that happened during this 200 years. Because of the scattering at Babel, we do know that tribes are migrating and cultures are developing as people began to multiply and fill the earth. People left Babel. They got with people that spoke the same language as them. And cultures began to form. Donations and races began to form as people began migrating across the earth and filling it as God had told them back in Genesis chapter 9, but which they rebelled. Initially, we do know that as time went on after scattering, that mankind was getting further and further away from the knowledge and the worship of the one true God. They weren't getting closer, but as they began to scatter, their hearts began to scatter, and surely the false worship followed them as they began to be further and further away from true worship. Most of the world's population decided to rebel against God by staying in one place and building a tower for a false religion. And we looked at that in detail, what was it, last week, and that false religion, really astrology, worship of the sun, the moon, and the stars. We'll look at a little bit of details of that tonight. But they rebelled against God at this time, and then they spread out, and they took this across the globe, this astrology, this fake, false religion. It spread throughout the world, invading families and cultures, and we still see this today through false religion. I mean, it's it's so popular in our uh, in our nation, our time. I know uh, an a um, actually an ABA pastor's wife who loves this book about astrology and stars and the gospel in the stars. Let me tell you, the gospel is in the word. Amen. Uh, the gospel's not in the stars; it's in the word. Uh, we can see God's glory in the stars, sure, uh, but it's through His word uh, that we are saved, not through the stars. So. Th- it did a spread since Babel, and uh, it has really infiltrated our culture, and, and it's so popular, you know, look what, um, what is it, what sign you are based upon your birthday and, and, and your future and the stars. It, it's all false. It is all false religion. So despite sin spreading across the world, despite people worshiping false gods and rebelling against the one true God, by the way, that one pastor's wife, not my wife, she doesn't believe in that star stuff so uh, that's uh, it's definitely not a list so despite sin spreading across the world despite people worshiping false gods and rebelling against the one true god during the 200 years between the flood and the birth of Terah, 
God's plan was still on schedule. And that's what's amazing. Despite all this that happened, despite the scattering at Babel, God still had a plan. God's plan was still in motion. You see, God was preparing a special nation to receive and transmit His Word to other nations. He was preparing the nation Israel. They would be the lighthouse. They would be His chosen nation to carry the Word, the truth to all nations. But before He could found a nation, He needed to prepare a man that would found the nation. That man would be Abraham, Father Abraham. God was continuing His plan and promise of Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman that would crush the head of the serpent. God would use a man named Abraham to become the father of the nation of Israel, a nation through whom the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, would come. And that was uh, fulfilling, and that was God's plan, and He was carrying it out. He was not leaving that promise. And we're going to see this man being born in his genealogy in our text today. Genesis 11, 10 through 32, that's our text, gives us the genealogy leading up to the birth of Abraham, as well as some geographic details of where Abraham was located. You see, Genesis 1 through 11, you, you, and you do need to really kind of divide Genesis up into two sections, Genesis 1 through 11, Genesis 12 through 50. Genesis chapter 1 through 11 covers how many years, you think? About 2,000 years. We've, man, we've done that in a year, a little less than a year. We've covered 2,000 years here uh, at Bethel in less than a year. Well, uh, how good is that? But Genesis chapter 12 through 50 records 350 years. So we, we really see uh, the difference in these, in, in these books. Um, Genesis 11 has been working towards the birth of this specific man, Abraham, and the birth of, his, of the specific nation, Israel. That's really what has been working toward to show Israel who the true God is, who creator God is, and then how they became to be and what their mission is. And as we will see in Genesis 12, Israel is God's chosen nation, His chosen people to carry His message to all of the nations of the world. Genesis 1-11 through 11 has given us a broad look at the beginning of really all things. We've seen the beginning of heaven and earth and plants, animals, sun, moon and stars, mankind, sin, sacrifice, forgiveness, murder, polygamy, the family of Noah, a new world after a worldwide flood of judgment and the salvation of eight people. We've seen the beginning of government and law, the beginning of different languages and cultures. Genesis 11 will end by introducing us to the beginning of the nation of Israel through Abraham. This is truly the book of beginnings. We're going to zoom in in Genesis 12, really here in 11. Zoom in on one family. If you want to understand the Bible, very simple. Genesis 1 through 11, 2,000 years. Okay? The beginning of all things, and it zooms in on Abraham and all his children. They are 12 through 50. Abraham and all his children, his physical and his spiritual children through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're zooming in on in Genesis 12 through 50. Well, we're met with another genealogy here in chapter 11. Isn't that fun? We've seen several genealogies already. Our first one we saw in Genesis chapter 5. Uh, I believe that was the genealogy through Seth, right? Um, Adam had two sons, at least, right? Cain and Abel. And uh, Cain killed Abel, so we know that the line's not going to go through Cain. But he had another son named Seth. And Seth, uh, through Seth's line, is whom Noah was born and his three sons. So in Genesis 5, we see Adam through uh, Adam to Noah, through Adam's son Seth. In Genesis 10, the table of nations we looked at a few weeks ago, we see the genealogy of Noah through all the nations across the earth, through his sons Japheth, Ham, and Shem. And here in 11, we see the genealogy of Shem through Abraham, uh, Shem to Abraham through Shem's son Arphaxed. Now, the genealogy is remarkably different than the one in Genesis 5. Do you remember kind of the theme in Genesis 5, the, the um, genealogy there? It repeated over and over and over and over. Do you remember what that was? It says, and he died, and he died, 
and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died. There's this emphasis on death. But here, we don't see that emphasis in our text today. Of course, they died, but Genesis 5 through 1 stressed the death prevailed in the race. But Genesis 11, uh, 10 through 26, because it's talking about the line of redemption, the promised line of redemption, it doesn't stress death. It stresses a movement away from death toward the promise, and it stresses life and expansion, even though longevity of life was declining. Years were declining. We're going to see that. Yet it never says and they died. It was stress in life and they lived and they lived and they lived. That's appropriate looking at the line of the promised line of redemption. So in our text today, God will show us how and where Abraham came to be. The father of the nation of Israel. 200 years of history and this genealogy is the only thing God chooses to record. It must be important. The staggering effect of the life of Abraham on the history of humanity cannot be overemphasized. All the rest of Scripture and world history revolves around Abraham and his descendants. Scripture refers to Abraham some three hundred and on some three hundred and eight occasions in the Old Testament and the New Testament. All right, let's dive right into our text and let's look at Shem to Terah. Shem to Terah, it's really our first point, verse 10 through 26. These are the generations of Shem. Shem was 100 years old and begat our facts sad two years after the flood. And Shem lived after he begat our facts at 500 years and begat sons and daughters. And Arphaxad had lived five, five and thirty-five years and begot Salah. And Arphaxad had lived after he begot Salah four hundred and three years and begat sons and daughters. And Salah lived thirty years and begat Eber. And Salah lived after he begat Eber four hundred and three years and begat sons and daughters. And Eber lived four, four and thirty years and begat Peleg. And Eber lived after he begat Peleg 430 years and begat sons and daughters. And Peleg lived 30 years and begat Ru. And Peleg lived after he begat Ru 209 years and begat sons and daughters. And Ru lived 2 and 30 years and begat Serug. And Ru lived after he begat Serug 207 years and begat sons and daughters. And Serug lived 30 years and begat Nahor. And Sarug lived after he begat Nahor two hundred years and begat sons and daughters. And Nahor lived nine and twenty years and begot Terah. And Nahor lived after he begot Terah a hundred and nineteen years and begat sons and daughters. And Terah lived seventy years and begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. So let's look at this. I think there are some things that we can learn from even this genealogy in itself. The pattern, and these genealogies you see in Genesis, there's always really a pattern that you can identify. There's a pattern in Genesis 5, Genesis 10. There's a pattern here in Genesis 11. Someone lived X years and had a son. Now, was this their firstborn son or not? I don't know. The text doesn't specifically mention it was their firstborn son. It could just be mentioning the son that they had through whom Abram would come through. We know that after they lived so many years, they begat this son. And then after they begat this son, they lived so many years and they begat other sons and daughters. So they could have very well had other sons or daughters uh, before. Uh, we know they had sons and daughters after. Scripture makes that very, very clear. So we've got someone lived X years and had a son. And then that someone had a son, they lived X years and begat sons and daughters. So they lived this many years, had a son, then they lived this many years longer after that son, and then they begat sons and daughters. One thing we see in this text is that the average age began to decrease due to sin and the environmental conditions after the flood. We see a decrease in the longevity of life. The average age... What would you guess? Uh, I mentioned it just once in the sermon in Genesis 5. Was the average age in Genesis 5 before the flood? In that genealogy. 
It was around 880 years. Long time. This average begins to decrease drastically as time goes on. Shem was born before the flood, survived the flood, and he lived to be 600 years old. So that's interesting. Shem, the first one we're introduced to, lives to be 600 years old. What does it say in verse 10? These are generations of Shem. Shem was 100 years old and begat Arphaxed two years after the flood. And Shem lived after he begat Arphaxed 500 years. 500 plus 100, 600. He lived to be 600 years. He was born before the flood. But eight generations later, from Shem all the way down to Abraham, the average lifespan is under 200 years. That's a huge decline. That's 600 years average difference from Genesis 5 to Genesis, the end of Genesis 11. Shem lived to be 600. Arphaxed, and you can follow me in your text if you want, Arphaxed, that's in verse 12 to 13, lived to be 438. Salah, verses 14 and 15, lived to be 433. Eber, in verse 16 and 17, lived to be 464. Then we have Peleg, who lived only to be 239. Then Ru lived to be 239. Sarug lived to be 230. Nahor lived to be 148. We see slowly declining. Well, then we go to Terah. He did live to be 205. So the average age has gone down to under 200 years. At the end, by we see Terah. We also see in this text that the average lifespan for having children was declining fairly. Uh, Shem was 100 when he had Arphaxed, and then we jump down to Arphaxed was 35. Salah was 30, Eber was 34, Peleg was 30, Ru was 32, uh, Sereg was 30, and Nahor was 29. Terah seems to be an outlier here because it says Terah was 70 when he had one of the sons. So let's talk about Peleg for a minute. So kind of introduce to you the pattern, kind of introduce to you that there is the declining in age, and that is due to two factors. That is due to sin, the sin in the world. Uh, it brings death, but also the environmental conditions after the flood had changed. So let's talk specifically about just a few of these names, and Peleg is one of them. Now, do you remember what Peleg means? What Peleg means? In his days, something happened. What was that that happened? The earth was divided. Peleg means to split or to divide. It's likely that he was born the year of the dispersion at Babel and thus named after the dispersion to split or to divide. Some people even attribute his name to the division of the continents uh, as they began to divide from one main continent. So let's go back up to verse... 16 and 17. Eber. Now Eber. What do we remember about Eber? The Hebrew, right? That's where we get the word Hebrew. It says, And Eber <clears throat> begat Eber. And Sal lived after he begat Eber 403 years and begat sons and daughters. Eber lived four and thirty years and begot Peleg. And Eber lived after he begot Peleg 430 years. So Eber lived to be 464 years old. But then we jump down to Peleg, verse 18. And Peleg lived 30 years and begat Ru. And Peleg lived after he begat Ru 209 years and begat sons and daughters. So from Eber 464, then Peleg was 239. And then after Peleg, it was 239, 230, 145, 205. It seems like something happened between Eber and Peleg that the age went down significantly. 200 years average went down. What do you think happened? There had to be a big event of some sort, right? And what was that big event? The dispersion, right? Uh, it, somehow it affected their lifespan. Uh, Peleg, named after the, the dispersion to divide or to split, when that happened, it seems like lifespan decreased even 200 more years. I want to give you something interesting as well. If it is the case that he was named after the, the, the dispersion and the division, then the dispersion at Babel happened around 100 years after the flood. We can know that by just backdating their ages. So if the dispersion happened 100 years after the flood, this would mean the population of the world at the time of the Tower of Babel was not significantly large, probably less than 10,000 people. So we don't even see a huge population at the Tower of Babel, uh, less than 10,000 people. We can see now significantly how the whole world could be gathered there 
together. It must be remembered only after the flood, there was only eight people that got off the got off the ark, and they only had a hundred years to reproduce. So ten thousand is a high number with maybe what the world population was at that time. Okay, let's go on to verses twenty-seven to thirty-two and really get into some meat of this text. Terah to Abraham. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran begot Lot. And Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity in Ur of the Chaldees. And Abraham and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. But Sarai was barren, she had no child. And Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran his son's son, and Sarai, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan, and they came into Haran and dwelt there. And the days of Terah were two hundred and five years, and Terah died in Haran. So, a few interesting things to kind of wrap your mind around to understand the, really the connection here. Number one, Noah lived until Terah was 128 years old. Okay, Noah lived probably two years before Abraham was born, which is incredible. Think about the connection there. Noah uh, and his family survived the, the flood of judgment, and Noah would have lived 128 years with Abram's father, Terah. That is really interesting to think about. Two years before Abraham was born. Shem, which is Noah's son, would have lived 150 years after Abraham was born. So Abraham, uh, Shem, which is the promised line through whom the Messiah would come, Noah's son would live 150 years during, Abr during Abraham's time. Now, I don't know the Bible mentions specifically that they knew each other, but we can imagine that they did. So Terah, let's talk about Terah a little bit because our text kind of starts with him in verse 27. Now these are generations of Terah. Terah at some point in his life was a pagan. Okay, don't think that Terah was just worship the one true God all his life. No, like not just likely, the Bible makes it clear that he was a pagan, that he worshipped false gods. Joshua chapter 24, verse 2. And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nacor, or Nahor, and they served other gods. So we see that Abraham's father, Terah, served other gods. Therefore, he was a pagan. He served multiple gods. The Bible makes that very clear. And I think this is important to know that Abram was not raised with a father that worshipped the one true God. Nevertheless, Abraham chose to put his faith in the one true God. And we again see how God has used even people that have rejected Him. Genesis 31.53 does say this. It says, The God of Abraham and the God of Nahor, the God of their father. So presumably, it doesn't mention His name, talking about Terah, Judge betwixt us. So this verse evidently is either speaking in broad terms as to identify God as the only true God and thus the God of everyone living, regardless whether they acknowledge it or not, or it could indicate that at some point Terah worshipped the one true God but fell away to pagan worship later. Or pagan worship dominated over worship to the one true God. I don't know, but evidence, and we're going to see, he lived in Ur, and then he went to uh, Haran and did not leave Haran. These are the two biggest cities for pagan worship during this time. It would, it would be evident that during the time he had his children that 
he worshipped other gods. It says in verse 27, now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran begot Lot. Now, Abram was not um, Terah's firstborn son. Even though he's mentioned first, it's for prominence. It's not because he was his firstborn son. And we're going to see evidence of that with Scripture. There's a, there is a certain Scripture when you're looking at Abraham, his birth and his beginnings in the New Testament that you do need to be familiar with. I always want to make connections there. And that is Acts chapter 7, verses 2 through 4. And I'm going to use that verse in a minute to prove to you again that uh, Abraham was not Terah's firstborn son. Abraham, uh, Terah actually begat Abraham when he was 130 years old. Genesis 11.32 says the days of Terah were 205 years old and he died. Well, in Genesis chapter 12, verse 4, it says this. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. After his father died, he left. That's what Acts 7.4 says. He didn't leave until his father died. So if his father died at 205 years old and he was 75, then he was born when his father was 130, right? Look at Acts 7, 2 through 4. And he said, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Charon or Haran. So when he was in Ur of the Chaldees, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and come into the land which I shall show thee. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Charon. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into this land wherein ye now dwell. So we see the age of um, Abraham or Terah when he begat Abraham. The names of Nahor and Aran, uh, Abram's two brothers, the, they also are associated with cities. Uh, Nahor was named after his grandfather. If you look at verse 24, Nahor lived and be, uh, 20 years and begot Terah. So he, Nahor is obviously named after his grandfather, and there also were cities named after these two boys. Now, we see something very interesting in um, 27, and Haran, and Haran begot Lot. I mean, all these boys had children, right? But we see one specifically mentioned. Why? Again, when you see a specific name mentioned, is it not, not just throwing that out there that Haran begot Lot, uh, it's very specific. Israel would need to know that. Lot would be a very key player in Israel's history, in the Old Testament history, would he not? Actually, Lot would be the father of the Moabites and the Ammonites, two uh, cities that we looked at this morning that Israel would intermarry and intermingle with sinfully. Lot would be a person mentioned again in Genesis, and his descendants would later be the antagonist to Israel. Abram's and Nahorn's wives. Let's look at them. Also, I think that's significant. Verse 29, And Abram and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai. And the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah. The daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. So, Sarai and Milcah, they were actually named after false gods. Actually, false. Actually, the moon god from astrology, the false Babylonian religion. Now, that doesn't represent uh, who they worship. Absolutely not. But it does represent the culture. It does represent uh, the families that they grew up in. And it shows that they were named after these false gods. The name Sarai, variant spelling of Sarah, means princess or lady. And we'll look at that a little later in Genesis. But... Sherah too was the name of the wife of the moon god Sin. The original name may reflect the culture out of which the patriarch was called for the family did worship other gods in Mesopotamia. We've already mentioned that. Sarat was one of the gods in the ancient pantheon, the Babylonian pantheon. In fact, Sarat was one of the names for the god Ishtar, and Ishtar was the goddess of the planet Venus. So here we are back to the astrology again, indicating these people were all mingled in this Mesopotamian astrological cult. Now Milka means queen. 
But more to the point here is that the fact that Malkutu was a title for Ishtar, the daughter of the moon god. If the women were named after such titles, that would, uh, again, it doesn't necessarily imply anything about the faith of the women themselves, but where they came from and what they're named after. You see, Milka was named queen, and we actually see a false astrological Babylonian god named the Queen of Heaven being worshipped in the Old Testament by Israel. Uh, and this is uh, likely uh, who Milka was named after. And I'll read a verse there. The Queen of Heaven is a false deity that Israel worshipped in the Old Testament. Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 17 through 18. Seest thou not what they do in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood and the fathers kindle the fire and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods that they may provoke me to anger. You can even look at Jeremiah 44, 17 through 19 mentions the queen of heaven several times. So we see Sarai and Milka, princess and queen, uh, named after these false astrological deities. Now, the, word, the name Iska at the end of verse 29, I didn't find much on Iska. I did not find much on the name Iska. Another thing I want to point out, I don't know if you noticed, but it says in verse 29, And Abram and Nahor took them wives. And the name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iska. Now, who's Haran? You got Abram, Nahor, and who's Haran? Well, this is this man's name, the same as his brother, right? So, when we first read this text, we think, okay, so Nahor married his niece, Milcah, Haran's daughter. Did he? Well, I don't know. From the description, it seems like it may be a different Nahor because it didn't say um, a different Haran. It didn't say that it was Abram's son or their brother. It, it specifically mentions this Haran, the father of Milcah and the father of Iscah. It seems to differentiate this Haran, but very likely could be the same Haran and that um, Nahor married his niece Milcah, which we had seen in the early times. There was not a law against it, but there later would be. And that was to populate the earth. Now, probably one of the most important pieces of this text is now we move to verse 30. But Sarai was barren. She couldn't have children. She was barren. Why is this significant? Why is this important? Well, let's talk about Sarai for a minute. Who was she? Well, she was his sister. We do know that. Sarai was Abram's sister. Genesis 20, 12, and yet indeed she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. Evidently, Sarai was also a daughter of Terah, but Terah had more than one wife. So she was only a half-sister to Abram. So we see Abram married his half-sister, Sarai. And she was barren. Now Abram, unlike Haran and Nahor, had no children, neither Ur or Mesopotamia. He didn't have children in Ur or Mesopotamia. He had children in the promised land. You see, the child of promise would be born in the land of promise. The child of promise would be born in the land of promise. But this little description of Sarah is very important here for it would set the stage for the faith of Abraham. It would, would it not? It was Abraham had faith and it would set the stage for his faith. Sarai um, was barren, but yet, <laughs> and we'll see um, in Genesis 17, 5 that God changed his name. His name, Abram, an exalted father. He had a barren wife. And then before she had a child, God changed his name to Abraham, which means father of a multitude. And he's thinking, how in the world 
am I going to be the father of a multitude <laughs> and my wife is barren? It would really set the stage for the faith of Abram. Talk just a second about the town of Ur. It says in verse 31, And Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran his son's son, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from, the, from Ur of the Chaldees. The town of Ur was known and is known by archaeologists and historians as the major center of the worship of the moon god in ancient Mesopotamia. So it was really the center after Babel of the fall of the worship of the moon god. Ur is modern Iraq. So if you want to know where's Ur right now, it is modern Iraq. And this would explain why Terah was living there and raising his family there. We know that he worshipped other gods. Now, are the Chaldeans, uh, the Chaldeans didn't dwell there at that time. That would be the description Israel would understand, Ur the Chaldeans. Uh, later, the Chaldeans would dwell there, but it was described as Ur and Chaldeans because, again, we must remember that this is written for Israel when they're in the wilderness, and they would read it then and understand it as Ur the Chaldeans then. Chaldean, that just really is associated with the Babylonian people. So, Terah and his family, Abraham, Sarai, and Lot, Nahor seemed to stay behind in Ur. It didn't say Nahor came with them. and At least for a little while he stayed back. And They leave for the land of Canaan. They leave for the promised land, right? They leave for the land that God had promised them all the way back in Genesis chapter 9, verse 26. We know specifically that God led Abraham out of Ur and told him to go to Canaan, right? Not just Terah. Now, maybe God led Terah as well. Or maybe they just followed him. But we know specifically when Abram was in Ur of the Chaldees that God told him to leave there and to go to Canaan. Again, that's in Acts chapter 7, verse 24. And he said, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appealed unto our father Abraham. I believe that's Stephen speaking. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran and said to him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and come into the land which I shall show thee. Then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran and from thence when his father was dead he removed into this land wherein ye now dwell. So we know specifically Abraham, that's important, was instructed by God to go. But regardless, Terah follows or God also gave Terah these instructions and Lot follow his lead along with his wife Sarai. Abram's wife Sarai. Again, the land of Canaan is the promised land. God said the descendants of Shem would inhabit. You see, God had plans for his chosen people through the line of Shem. And part of that plan was to give them the land of Canaan. God would fulfill this plan through the father of the nation Israel, Abraham. But we see in the end of verse 31, and they came into Haran and dwelt there. They never made it to Canaan. They get to a city of Haran and they dwell there. Did God tell them to stop? Did God tell Abraham to stop in Haran? No, God told Abraham to go to Canaan. But he didn't. He stayed in Haran. This city might have been named after Terah's son, Haran. It was at least associated with him. Nevertheless, the town bears his name. But again, archaeologists and history tell us that Haran was the second chief center of worship for the moon god. By the way, the moon god's name was Sin. S-I-N. So you think maybe Terah got up there. He got a sniff of familiar worship. Maybe he said, let's settle right here, right here. Let's not go over the river and down to, into Canaan. This is our place. Here's the second great center of worship for the moon god. So they settled there. Terah, once he settled there, had no desire to obey God. Had no desire to continue to go down to Canaan. You see, listen to this. This is the biggest application and really the end of our text. I think the biggest spiritual application of our text, and I want you to get this. You see, the prosperity and comfort in Haran were too great of a temptation for Terah to give up. It was comfortable. It was nice. It was a big city. It was 
pleasurable. Terah didn't want to give that up to go down into Canaan. He wanted to stay right there. Well, we're not really specifically talking about Terah. We're talking about Abram. We know he specifically was told by God, but he stayed there as well until Terah died. What do you think the name Terah means? Delay. Delay. Abraham, whom we know God gave a direct commandment to go into Canaan, also chooses to stay in Iran. Abram had had traveled 700 miles, but he stopped as he approached the final difficult leg of his journey. What does this mean to us? Are we here? Are we engaged? What does this mean to us? Many a child of God leaves earth, the old life. To seek the promised land. That's the committed life. But is sidetracked by the comforts and pleasures of Haran. That's the comforts of the uncommitted life. They start out. They want to be committed. And then they get sidetracked. And they get choked by the cares of the world. And they just dwell there in Haran. They are fearful of the hardships and the sacrifices of the journey to total surrender. So, Bethel, Christian, do not settle in Haran, enjoying the vain comforts of the uncommitted life, but follow God fully to the promised land as you fully commit to serve Him. Maybe you started the journey of commitment but you've gotten sidetracked by the world and left your commitment to God. It is time to recommit your life to the Lord and to follow Him. Our last verse says, And the days of terror were 200 years, 205 years, and terror died in Iran. He never made it. He died right there in the uncommitted life. Let that not be us. And all in all, this whole text is what I named the title, The Promised Line of Redemption. You see, that's what this text is really all about. From Shem to Abram, I named Abraham father of the nation of Israel through whom the Messiah would come. It is only through Jesus Christ that one can be redeemed and saved from the penalty of their sins. I ask, have you repented of your sins and placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? It's the promised line of redemption we see here through whom the Savior and the Lord would come. Have you been saved? Have you repented of your sins and put your faith and trust in Him? Let's pray. God, we thank You for Your text. The details in it, God, the words that you chose to record for us. Thank you for the truths that we find in it, for preserving your word for us. God, may you use it in our hearts tonight. May we be better servants to you and even more so realize that your whole word points to the Lord Jesus Christ, God, our Redeemer. Lord, and I pray, if there's nobody, if there's somebody here that does not know the Redeemer, does not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior and their Lord, God, they wouldn't delay any longer. But that they would accept Him. That they would believe in Him. All these things I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.